On the Strong Women podcast today, we our guest is Erica Bakiaki, and she is a fellow at the Ethics in Public Policy Center. She's also the author of a book called The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision. And she's a co-author of an amicus brief in the Dobbs versus Jackson on behalf of 240 women scholars and professionals and pro-life feminist organizations. So I want to just kind of lay out for our listeners just a little bit about why we're having Erica on. Um, other than that she is an awesome lady and doing awesome things, we wanted to talk to her specifically about this that you you saw in her book title about women's rights and also all the stuff that's happening with the Supreme Court. I feel like often when it comes to um, when we talk about women's rights uh, and we're talking with someone who is pro-abortion as a pro-lifer, they say, well, this is a woman's right. And I think often as we just kind of go, uh-uh, no, it's not. But we don't have that foundation of, okay, wait, let's back up and say, why is this a woman? Why is this considered a woman's right? And where did that shift happen in America? And then where are we today? And what's going on with all these Supreme Court cases? So, Erica, thank you for coming, and we're excited to talk to you about all these things. Thank you. It's really great to be with you both. Okay, Erica, we um, want to talk to you about your work and have you teach us and our audience about this important topic. But before we do that, we like to get to know you as a person and hear your story and how that formed you into the woman you are today. So um, let's start at the beginning and just tell us where you grew up, you know, your your family situation growing up and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, actually, as it turns out, my story uh, is sort of important in the question of women's rights as well. <laughs> so I um, I grew up in uh, the state of Maine um, in a family, actually, in which my mom was married and divorced three times before my 19th birthday. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of sort of turmoil um, growing up. I um, was the product of her first marriage. So I Um, Didn't really see my father much after I was four years old. Um, And so you can imagine, as kind of the textbooks tell us, that by 13, which was right after um, my mom's second divorce, I kind of jumped into a life of, well, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is the best way to put it. Um, And at 16, I lost a friend, a pretty close friend, to suicide. So jumping ahead to 17, I found myself in 12-step meetings. and really stopped kind of all the self-destructive behavior at that point um, at the ripe old age of 17 <laughs> um, when I was uh, just approaching my uh, you know senior year in high school. Um, but uh, what happened then was um, getting into college. I really, because of all that turmoil, I went to a small college in Vermont um, and really fell right into the Women's Center on campus. I was a... Um, in high school, I'd been really a jock, kind of a tomboy. I was very athletic. Um, But I think because of just all of that sort of emotional turmoil that I felt, I really had sort of, you know, as you can imagine, some unresolved issues around men. And so I actually started um, studying in the women's studies um, department and uh, found myself very captivated by feminist arguments because I hadn't you know, I'd been baptized as a child, um, but really uh, did not live in at all a Christian home, really didn't know any um, Christians at all, uh, as far as I knew anyway. <laughs> so I hadn't been kind of given an alternative to the sex, ro- drugs, and rock and roll um, kind of worldview that I inhabited until I got to the 12-step programs, but they were really only giving me kind of a guide for living, um, which was a wonderful guide and helped me quite a bit and really taught me how to pray for that. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, but I didn't have this kind of a philosophical or historical worldview in which to um, situate kind of my new way of life. Um, and so women's studies and kind of feminism provided, I guess, that you could say. Um, I even uh, you know, worked uh, one summer for uh, then Congressman, now Senator Bernie Sanders, because I was up in Vermont. So I kind of considered myself a socialist feminist at that point. But something else really tragic happened. When I was 19, um, the, a second friend took his life. And 
this friend, I was even closer to than, than the first. Um, I was really enamored with him. He was a high school friend. And I'd spent the summer um, really trying to help him with kind of the help that I'd received through prayer and through the steps and all of that. Um, but it was to no avail. And he um, hung himself in August. So it really sent me kind of roiling. And I you could say I just um, deepened my prayer. I started to work the steps in a really um, serious way. And as it happened, um, my college, my very liberal college that January had um, a symposium on religion. And so I just started going, I was really kind of against any institutionalized religion, but I started going to all of these talks. Um, and one in particular um, was very interesting to me. And that was uh, by this Catholic worker, um, uh, a guy from the Catholic worker movement who was talking about recovery from drug addiction. So I went to argue with him because I thought the Catholic Church was like the most misogynist institution on earth. And they brought me to um, a Catholic meeting afterwards. And I was still kind of horrified that I was there. But here were all these Christians talking about prayer. And I had this, it was like cognitive dissonance because I had, you know, they were talking about Jesus and the church, but they were also talking about prayer and humility. And so I had this strange situation where I went back to my dorm room after that meeting and I literally got on my knees as my 12 step meetings had taught me. And I asked God who I said, you know, you and I are really good friends now. Well, do you have a son? <laughs> and, um, kind of a funny question to ask, but as it, you know, as God works out these things, I, um, was then given the book by C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity and kind of read myself back into Christianity first. Um, and then eventually, um, into the Catholic Church, which was my baptismal faith, and kind of the rest, I guess you could say, is history, except for the feminism part, where I guess I would just say I kind of abandoned it for a time um, and really started studying political philosophy, a lot of ancient philosophy, Aristotle. Um, and um, and then over time came to see that a lot of the feminist theory I had read, um, really that I could answer the questions that I had as a feminist better as someone who had a Christian worldview. And so I sort of plunged myself into that work as a scholar. And it's, I think, been um, really beneficial both for myself and I think some people who kind of have a feminist orientation but are dissatisfied um, with the answers that the feminist movement gives. And so it's led me back um, into where my book brought me, which is really the history of, of feminist thought, but especially um, that thought before feminism um, and that is the the work of the earliest women's rights advocates in the United States, which, of course, I'm sure we'll talk about. What That is a powerful story. I'm so glad that you shared that. Wow. God, do you have a son? Like, could you tell me about this guy? <laughs> That's so great. Okay, so before we move forward with your work, I just, hearing your story, I am I wanted to ask. So today, just even that word feminist, it comes with as you said, so much history and a lot of baggage, right? <laughs> so do you identify yourself as a feminist today? And if so, why or why not? Yeah, that's a really, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> and the, even the word identify today is a funny one. It's a loaded <laughs> term. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you could parse yeah. the entire sentence, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, <clears throat> feminism is interesting. I would say um, that I've used the term pro-life feminist to describe myself for a really long time. Um, and I think that there's no better word than feminist except for women's rights advocate. And so I do sometimes use that instead. And so when I talk about the earliest women's rights advocates, um, you know, who I've written a lot about, I do tend to call them women's rights advocates because the term feminism is just anachronistic. But as a shorthand, I sometimes use feminist for myself. And one of the reasons I used to do that was actually, um, well, to tick people off, actually, <laughs> because I sort of liked the inflaming way um, that especially people to my left, um, pro-choicers, would be kind of offended that I would use that term as a pro-lifer. But nowadays, I actually use the term feminist, um, and I'm a bit more comfortable in it for a couple of different reasons. One is because of the transgender movement that has really kind of taken over the feminist movement today, because I think it is so clearly anti-woman um, that I just think it's almost like those of us who just believe in basic women's rights need to kind of recover the term feminism. And it's something I've been doing for a long time. So I sort of 
um, and more comfortable in that term. And then the second reason is, I think, because of some of the reemergence of a real hardcore kind of traditionalism, which really um, wants to claim that women are really uh, subordinate to men um, and that they kind of just belong in the kitchen. And so for those two reasons, kind of one from my far right and one from my far left, um, I tend to use the term pro-life feminism, and I'm a bit more comfortable with it these days than I would say before, where it was a bit more rhetorical. <laughs> I feel like I feel like that's a great term to gauge the room. Like I'm a feminist. Okay, I see where you are, and I see where you are. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> so, um, well, actually, yeah, the the let's talk. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking that's a great way, Erica, to you know, invite conversation because pro-life right. connected with feminists is going to stop people in their tracks and say, um, sorry, excuse me, what did you just say? Because they don't see those terms as going together. So I, I appreciate that. I was curious about that. I feel like in this moment that we're in, we do have everything upside down. Um, and kind of what you're talking about with the transgender movement and the fact that you know, um, people like J.K. Rowling who speak out ag against that being, um, you know, that it w against that being called woman, right? Um, and they're sidelined and told they're actually haters. And um, we talked with Glenn Stanton, who works for Focus on the Family, and he wrote an article that basically said transgenderism is the new misogyny. And which is so interesting, right? I mean, they're just trying to erase even like breastfeeding the terms like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, even just calling oneself a mother or a father. I mean, I think you're right. Chest feeding, you know, women who or people who bleed, you know, it's um, it's really quite atrocious. And I think that's right. I think it is the new misogyny. And not only that, but I mean, if you look even back at, you know, Caitlyn or Bruce become Caitlyn Jenner in the very first, I mean, I'm certainly not the first person to say this, but it really, you know, it works in this highly stereotypic way of thinking about women, you know, that a man wants to inhibit a woman's highly sexualized body. I think a lot of this comes out of pornography. A lot of people have detransitioned, they'll talk about how pornography was um, sort of a gateway drug into this whole kind of cult. Um, and I think that that's, you see that with all the, the, these girls too. You know, they want to flee womanhood because the, our culture is so highly sexualized. And this is, remember, like 60 years after the modern day feminist movement, um, where we have this incredible sexualization of children, of girls, um, through, of course, pornography, through this you know, mainstream of prostitution, calling it sex work, all of that. I mean, we're really in a very different place. And I think there is a way in which we do need to reclaim um, women's rights, which is, you know, what my work really is. And I think it it stands very much up and against this idea that anybody can inhabit kind of um, the name or the status of woman, because woman is something, um, something different from just, you know, what a person kind of conjures up in their mind about it. Um, it's something special and something we can say something about, right? Yeah. Let me let me ask this just for clarity, because um, in, in some of your writing, you talk about the different waves of feminism and like those early, those early feminist um, first wave feminism, we would agree with a lot of, of, I mean, we would agree with most of what they were promoting, right? Could you walk us through, and this will set us up good for the Roe v. Wade conversation, could you kind of walk us through first wave feminism, second wave feminism, and now would you consider us in a third wave? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Once it gets past second wave feminism, I kind of got to get off the boat. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you'll have to talk to other people about that who have more, you know, there's some great people, Abigail Favalli for one, who'd be great for you to talk about, who's really an expert in postmodern feminism. Oh. She could talk to you about sort of third and fourth wave feminist, but I, uh, yeah, I get off the boat around the second yeah. wave and more and, and do more analysis of the first two. So yeah, I think it's a great question to start because, um, you know, the first wave has a lot to teach us. And that's really what I'm um, trying to do in my book. And so where I mark the beginning is really with um, the thought of 18th century British philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft. And she in her own um, right has all sorts of um, you know, crazy things to say about her own life, which we can or cannot get in, you know, don't need to get into. But what's fascinating is that many think, many today think there's kind of an unbroken line 
from today's feminist movement, which itself is in you know shambles and is infighting and all that because of the trans movement, because of all sorts of other things, and has been for decades really, but that an unbroken line can be traced right back to her. And I think that that's really false. Um, and you can see this in a couple of different places. I mean, she's best known for her work in um, arguing for women's education and entry um, into kind of the rigors of like professional life, but she very much did not want to see women abandon um, their uh, their work as mothers. And she also really called men to fatherhood. Um, and one of the reasons she's so great in my mind and really provides kind of the philosophical foundations for what I'm doing in terms of recovering uh, kind of this older thought is that she views rights as a means, not an end. So she views freedom as a means, not an end. And so what does she see rights and freedom for, but to enable both men and women to discharge their duties? So she sees obligations as the priority over rights. And really what she sees is kind of the, she, she has a very particular view about what a human being is, and that both men and women share in this common you, we would kind of say vocation, but a common um, nature. And that is that they are both designed uh, for and become happy um, through living lives of virtue and wisdom. And so really their reason, their reasoning capacity that makes them different from the animals is ordered to living virtuously. So that is kind of living all those ways in which um, we would say are humanly excellent. So the virtues, you know, you can, uh, you know, from from something like patience and kindness, but also, you know, justice and fortitude and temperance. And temperance is a really interesting one for her because she was um, really one of the things she argued is that the cause of most of women's immiseration and suffering is what she calls the want or the lack of male chastity. And so she really wants to call men to live chaste lives. And that is not what you would call a modern day feminist call, <laughs> right? And so the earliest women's rights advocates in our country really took a lot from her. They took their rights theory from her. Um, so again, rights are really built on these prior obligations um, and that they're really, um, we, we need rights in order to give us the freedom to live virtuously, to do the right thing. Um, and so we don't really have rights to do wrong. And so um, and so this is really important when it comes to something like abortion. Abortion um, was, you know, has been kind of attempted for all of human history. And uh, the reason it became, um, uh, you know, a practice that grew in kind of um, more kind of popularity was right around the time of the first wave of the women's movement because um, it became a little bit more uh, safe to do. Generally, throughout all of human history, if you tried to abort a woman, <laughs> tried to stop a pregnancy, you would kill the woman. But with some surgical techniques and then at some point the advance of antibiotics, um, these, you know, became a bit safer. But we also had advances in understandings of what was actually going on in pregnancy. So prior to, you know, the early um, 19th century, we just sort of took, you know, women to be pregnant or, you know, kind of were cognizant of that around the time of what we called quickening when women could feel, you know, the baby moving in her body, which, you know, those of us who have been pregnant know it's about 17 weeks. Of course, the baby is pretty old by then. Unless you drink um, orange and juice so and lay on your stomach. Then it can be earlier, <laughs> okay, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> and so so microscopes started to help us know that actually it's this time of fertilization. It's far, far earlier. And so doctors started passing laws um, prohibiting abortion um, right around the same time of the 14th Amendment. So that's 18, the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, but also this time when women were making their first claims to really want, you know, women's suffrage, um, you know, equal education, um, uh, entry into the professions, all sorts of other things as well. And so what you have is this fascinating thing where the the women's rights advocates that we, that, you know, the second wave kind of hails back to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, 
someone like Victoria Woodhill, they were actually all pro-life. And many of us know have known this for a while, but to understand their philosophy underlying this is really important. So I want to just, um, without going on for too long, I want to quote one of them because Victoria Woodhill, because she is actually not a Christian. Many of these women's rights advocates were Christian. Victoria Woodhill is a really radical thinker, not very fond of marriage, um, but she is through and through pro-life. She talks about how um, children's rights, she was a big advocate of children's rights, children's rights begin, quote, while yet they remain the fetus. She was also one of the leading advocates for constitutional equality for women. She was the first woman to run for president of the United States on the equal rights platform. She was the first woman to testify before Congress. And I just want to read because I just think your listeners will just be amazed by this long quote she says in 1870. This is two years after the 14th Amendment, where there's a promise of equal protection of the laws, which those women understood that human beings in the womb also were equally human. And here's her quote. Many women, she says, who would be shocked at the very thought of killing their children after birth, deliberately destroy them previously. If there's any difference in the actual crime, we should be glad to have those who practice the latter pointed out. The truth of the matter it is, is that it is just as much a murder to destroy life in its embryonic condition as it is to destroy it after the fully developed form is attained, for it is the self-same life that is taken, which is an amazing, an amazing thing. So I just want to make two final points. One is that obviously the 1970s um, activists for abortion totally abandoned this insight that that rights are grounded in prior duties and that it would be untenable to claim that a mother could enjoy the right to end the life of her own child, which they very much knew was in the womb and that she owed duties of care to, right? But they also wanted men to take up those duties too. And so there's a second insight that the 1970s women's activists, women's rights activists uh, abandoned of those prior first wave feminists. And that is about the threats of undisciplined male sexual desire. And they didn't realize, and this is something the first wave feminists, they didn't just see abortion as bad for the unborn child. They also saw that if you separate sex and reproduction through abortion, but also through these kind of nascent methods of birth control, you are going to unleash undisciplined male sexual desire. And so you're going to end up absolutely with more male predatory behavior, all of those things that we saw women, you know, you know, be incredibly upset, upset about in Me Too, all those things are going to become, become more prevalent if you allow abortion to kind of be something that's considered um, easily accessible or especially a right. Um, and so that's exactly what ended up happening. So by abandoning all those insights by their of their predecessors, the 1970s women's movement ended up unleashing well the sexual revolution and all the harms to the sexual revolution that have befallen women and children and men in the last 50 to 60 years. Yeah, reading your articles and listening to some of your talks and now hearing you say this again, it just, you're saying that and it's like, yes, this is exactly why as a culture we are where we're at. It's not like the the access to abortion caused, um, you know, men to live these better sexual lives and were more self-controlled and you know, it, you're everything you're saying, I'm like nodding <laughs> because it's exactly what we see. And that explanation is so helpful in bringing us to, you know, really where we are today. And, and we wanted to talk to you, Erica, because of what presently is going on in the Supreme Court um, as it pertains to abortion. But so you've led us up now to the 1970s. Um, and some of the things that were abandoned. And I, I've learned from, from you the, and, and maybe this is how we can talk through it in a way to help our audience understand it. Because as I was thinking about talking to you, Sarah and I were saying, well, so many of our audience was born after Roe v. Wade. So we have been brought up in a country where abortion has always been legal. In like women's rights, even even the like abortion as women's rights is just so ingrained 
that it's an assumed idea, you know, that we don't know how to back up from. Exactly. It's like the, it's the air we breathe, you know, it's just like, oh, well, it's all abortion has always been a woman's right. So um, I'd love for you to explain the Roe v. Wade, especially for our, you know, audience who didn't, who wasn't alive during the time. And, and, and the argument that I've heard you talk about that there's been a shift in how people have argued for abortion and women's right. When it started with Roe v. Wade, they were arguing uh, for privacy. And then that changed in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey case in the 90s. So um, maybe if you could walk through that with us. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So the case that's before the Supreme Court right now, um, Dobbs v. Jackson, Women's Health Organization, just to kind of give a couple sentences on that so we see where we are, that it's a, it's a, it's a case in which Mississippi has passed um, a law that bans abortion in most cases after 15 weeks. And if you think about this, this is, you know, a rather moderate sounding law. Most of Europe has laws like this. But what's fascinating about our constitutional landscape is that Roe and Casey actually don't allow a ban on pre-viability abortion. So viability being, you know, around the time of 20 weeks when, you know, the child could, with lots of help, medical interventions, uh, you know, exist outside the womb. So in order to uphold this very moderate 15-week ban, um, you'd ha- the Supreme Court has to strike down Roe and Casey. So that's why we've kind of come to this head um, in a way that we haven't before since Planned Parent versus Casey, which is this 1992 case that upheld Roe v. Wade. And in that case, what's fascinating, as I kind of move back through the cases, the Supreme Court um, was actually kind of poised, you know, everybody thought to overturn Roe, a 1973 case, um, because there had been all these Republican administrations, Republican presidents who had put what they thought were kind of conservatives on the Supreme Court. But what happened was they actually upheld Roe, but kind of changed a lot of parts of it. And one of those things is exactly as you say, in Roe, the right to privacy was grounded, sorry, the right to abortion was grounded on the right to privacy, which the justices took to be, they kind of took out of some contraception uh, cases that they decided the decade before But of course, contraception and abortion are very different kinds of acts. One is preventing in generally, um, you know, human life to uh, to be conceived. And the other is killing that life. Right. So in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, they want to basically distance themselves somewhat from the road decision. So they talk about liberty, kind of bodily autonomy, personal autonomy. But they also talk a bit about equality. And there's this argument that women rely on abortion for their equality. And so that's one of the things that that's what the argument that um, my, you know, the, my amicus brief that I wrote with Helen Alvarez and Teresa Collette take on um, that we really want to argue against this idea for many of the reasons I've already told you about in terms of um, uh, how this was just not a good understanding of women's equality, but that actually relying on abortion has not only kind of emboldened men Um, to either engage in kind of predatory sex, but also walk away from women who are pregnant. But it's also, you know, ushered in this, this landscape in the workplace, where the kind of unencumbered male is um, just assumed to be the best worker. And, you know, pregnant women or women who are, you know, have children at home, or even men who have children at home aren't given the kind of flexibility they need to engage in their work and to take care of their children. So there's all sorts of ways in which this equality argument is really not so good. And the liberty argument isn't quite right either in the sense that really, can you talk about having bodily autonomy? What about the body of the other, uh, the actual child who's inside, that child should have rights based on their own bodily autonomy too, right? So we get back to, it all comes back to kind of Roe and the mistake that was made in Roe. And so in that case, you have seven of the justices Um, who are not relying on women's rights arguments. And this is a really important point. All the activism before Roe v. Wade is from population control advocates. And so what had been happening in the states prior is that there are a bunch of states who are starting to kind of reform 
those 19th, seven, sorry, 19th century abortion laws that I mentioned um, had been erected by doctors who came to see that fertilization was the beginning of the child's life. Um, that had that, you know, the women's rights advocates at that time thought were absolutely fine um, and good. Um, so they so some some of the states were basically trying to reform those laws um, and basically, you know, um, allow for abortion in, in cases of eugen uh, genetic um, deformation, in cases of poverty, those kinds of things. And these were all pushed by population control advocates. So this was not a women's rights issue at all. And so what you have in Roe is this kind of doctor focused case where they want to say in the privacy of, um, you know, the relationship between the doctor and patient, we should allow women to have this right to abortion, which Roe said is for three months. And so people kind of have in this, this idea that Roe v. Wade only allows abortion the first three months of pregnancy, but there's compa a companion case. That a lot of people don't know about that was decided the same exact day, which is called Doe v. Bolton. And that case said that really we need to consider the entire well-being of the woman and that um, exceptions can be made to this little three-month period all the way through nine months whenever a woman can say that her well-being would be harmed. And not just physical well-being, but her emotional, spiritual, psychological, family, etc. So really you've what Roe does is it strike, stru struck down every single law in the country uh, for all nine months. And that's the kind of abortion regime that pro-lifers have been fighting for the last nearly 60 years. Wow. Okay. That's so, <laughs> that is so helpful to walk that timeline. And I had never heard about that other case. And um, I mean, and Margaret Sanger, what, you know, we know that she was in it for the eugenics of it too, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I would. I would love to actually talk about Margaret Sanger because I think it's actually um, illuminating in the history of it. So Margaret Sanger, you know, she's writing in 1920, 1930, 1940, and she's really pushing for birth control. But her view, and it's very eugenic at that point, um, she really does want to control the kind of explosive population of those populations that are either unfit or are poor. And she wants to do this in the United States, and she wants to do this in other countries as well. And so it's um, got definitely a eugenic tinge. She actually, what's fascinating, if you compare, say, the first wave and Mary Wollstonecraft to Margaret Sanger, remember, what did Mary Wollstonecraft was the cause of immiseration, the cause of harm for women, and really for a lot of other social ills, Mary Wollstonecraft claims it's the lack of male chastity. So it's a lack of a virtue in men. Um, she also blames women for some things too. Let's be honest here. What is Mary, what does what Margaret Sanger blame? She blames women's very bodies. She blames women's fertility for the cause, not only of their own problems in their own life, for their own poverty, but she also blames women's fertility for all of war, all of all sorts of ills. She blames it for tyrants. I mean, she's it's incredible where she uses women's fertility as kind of the scapegoat for all sorts of ills. So this is the kind of real, and she's really, I think you would say, one of the turning points in how women's rights activists started to think about the problems that women had. They focus on the women's body. And by 1960, Margaret Sanger then comes, comes around with the birth control pill. And as you know, um, you know, many, many women who are on the pill have been giving themselves this kind of hormonal cocktail for so many years. So it maybe isn't so surprising that doctors are, you know, speeding forward to give girls who think they're boys other sorts of hormonal cocktails, right? I mean, this is kind of what we've been used to for a long time in the transgender movement, right? So um, getting back, the thing about Margaret Sanger that people don't realize so much, I mean, we focus on her eugenics, is that she actually was trying to prevent abortion. So the first handbill of Planned Parenthood, her the organization she founded, says, do not kill, do not take life, but prevent it. The next um, person uh, who ran Planned Parenthood after her, it was still a pro-contraception, anti-abortion outfit, was Alan Guttmacher. Alan Guttmacher um, during in the late 1960s, when people are talking about these reform bills for abortion, he was very clear that if you 
unleash abortion, if you start making abortion easily accessible, it's going to lessen people's use of contraception. So one of the things he said is, when abortion is easily obtainable, contraception is neither actively nor diligently used. And this is actually what comes to pass, is that contraception and the pill take on this kind of life of their own. They're thought to, let's prevent abortion, let's prevent unwanted um, um, unwanted uh, pregnancy, right, or non-marital births, which were going up. Um, but what happens is that they inspire this change in sexual behavior um, because people have little incentive to guard against kind of sexual risks, right? The risk of pregnancy with self-mastery, with chastity. And so they just pop their pill and think that they can control reproduction. But of course, as we know, every contraceptive technique has a failure rate, whether it's a method failure rate or a user failure rate. But people basically tar- started taking all these risks, having sex outside of marriage, especially thinking they could control, you know, the risks of sex. And so that's what then brings about this giant, giant um, increase in unwanted pregnancies and non-marital births after the pill, which is fascinating because it's this totally unintended consequence. And then that's what brings about those people who are trying to prevent abortion with the pill, with contraception, start saying, okay, now I guess we need abortion to control population growth. And so they start being the ones who push abortion, even though the population control hounds had been the ones who at first were trying to just use contraception to do so. So it kind of opens this whole can of worms. And that's why abortion then becomes the backstop to contraception that everybody, you know, um, feminists, etc., think it must be. Yeah. And that it's so interesting to think about the evolution of this um, because today, I you know when I when you think about rights and abortion and the whole argument, it's it very much is so different than when you read like you're saying, um, the the arguments of Roe v. Wade. It's it has more so much and and in an uh, article you wrote for National Review. Um, one thing I thought that the abortion case of the 90s, the Planned Parenthood Casey, and the shift that it made that you talk about so much is one thing I hadn't thought about, but I just think is so common today is the reliance interest that you talked about. But it's that this idea that children are an impediment to women's equality. And I think that idea is so assumed <laughs> that it, it's and and I didn't even think about it coming from this abortion shift women's rights argument in the 90s but that is just so prevalent today I think most women would say it, you know uh that they they have this you know, and of course, as followers of Christ, we, we fight this idea in the culture that children are somehow like an impediment to us or work against us instead of being a part of, for most of us, you know, the way God has designed our lives to go. Well, and the church has fallen into that too, wouldn't you say? In the language we use and the jokes we make. Exactly. So I, I wonder if you could talk about that piece too, Erica. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's really helpful to think back at how the earliest women's rights advocates wanted to think about equality because what they knew, what Mary Wollstonecraft knew, what the 1970s women's rights advocates knew, what you and I know is that there is an equ- an inequality, what I call an asymmetry at the very heart of the sexual act, right? Men and women, whether they're married or whether they're not married, engage in the same sexual act. But it is women who have both the burden and the privilege of bearing a child within them. And so all of these kind of different strains of feminism are trying to deal with that asymmetry. It's not just a difference, but it's a real inequality at the heart of sex. And so the first women's rights advocates and Mary Wollstonecraft said, men need to take up their burdens and the privilege of having and um, being responsible for children too. And so what you see, what I see in among my, you know, Catholic friends, among my Christian friends, 
is men, generally speaking, who take their responsibilities in the family incredibly seriously. Um, you see this the more and more children people have in some sense, that fathers really have to get on board, really have to be just as involved in the family as the mothers are. They may take on, they may their contributions in the family life may be different uh, depending on whether, you know, the mothers are working. I obviously, I know some families, incredible, you know, pretty traditional um, uh, Catholic families where the father's actually home and the, because the wife can make more money. I mean, there's all sorts of different arrangements, but both see their work raising their children in um, Christian virtue, in um, Christian joy and peace and, you know, um, the responsibilities they have as the most important work they do after being, um, you know, heeding kind of God's will and just their spiritual life, like, and their marriage, it's the most important thing that they do. And so that's why I think in some sense, and this is what I came to see after my own conversion was that the men I know, um, the Catholic men, I know the Christian men, I know, and the other kinds of religious, really serious religious men, um, they're kind of these emotionally sensitive, emotionally engaged men that I, as a feminist, had kind of hoped for, that I hoped I could find among kind of feminist men, whatever it is, um, because they're really answering that call in a really profound way. Um, and so I think when men do that, when men take the sexual act itself seriously as potentially procreative, right? That, that regardless of whether there's contraception involved, that a child could um, come to be from that act and so that they need to be in a committed marital relationship so that if a child does uh, come to be, that they are there to provide for that children, that child. But they also take seriously the fact that it is women who, um, who you know, take on more responsibility in, in, in um, childbearing, especially for those nine months, um, in breastfeeding, should they do it in an early caregiving, because that tends to be the model that you see most usually, and that, that they should be supporting that work um, and supporting the mo that most important work. And that's the other thing is that it's not just women's work. It's the most important work we do is raising the next generation and that we need fathers deeply engaged in that work. And that's what I tend to see in Christian and other religious communities. Well, we talk a lot about um, men and women. Like, we were designed to work in friendship together, like, of course, in marriage, but also just in friendship together. And what I'm noticing about how you're talking about um, Mary, what's her last name again? I, I, I'm Mary Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, like, that idea of rights as an end, as a means to an end, which is a virtuous life versus this is me i'm protecting me i need my rights and and it like divorce it, it like individualizes us even more like carl truman's um thing about how it the the biggest virtue right now is expressive individualism <laughs> which takes us out of community makes us self-focused and is not how reality works, even if we are hoping that it will eventually work that way. It just won't. And I love this idea that you're highlighting that those early women's rights advocates did not divorce it from our relationship to humanity as a whole. Like it's not just me and mine. It's that it's that it's for the life of the world, basically. That, that women should be treated with dignity and um, equality on that level and, and just how important men are in that. And I love what you're saying there too, because if a man is living virtuously and is raising a family, then then it's embodied for him. He he values women because he sees he sees that embodied in a different way. And I just I I've I'm really struck by how you're describing all of that. I was just going to say it's just it's a more hu what you're describing is a hum is a more human view of women and men. You know, instead of this like, well, women's equality means we get children out of the way so the women can work. <laughs> you know, quote unquote work. It's like that that's what my dignity and rights are based on, like so that little people won't get in my way so I can pursue this career. I mean, you know, and what you're describing for men and women, and that's why I, 
I just love this is it's this we are human. <laughs> and what that means is actually so much more beautiful than just what we produce for society. Yeah. And I think that's right. I mean, I think one of the big problems that I point to is this idea of kind of market equality, that in order to be equal, men and women have to kind of earn the same amount or at least work the same number of hours, you know, <laughs> they have to, they have to both be holden to the man, to the capitalist man, like that's what they should be doing out there. And it's just so absurd. Like, is that really freedom? Is that really equality? And so, right, there's this other model of like deep collaboration, reciprocity, that as you say, is so based in like, just hu being human. What is it to be human? It's to be deeply interdependent. It's to be deeply dependent on each other from when we're very small, even in the womb, to when we're infants, to when we're um, aged and sick, but also all the times in between, there's always this deep interdependence. And so the kind of collaboration that men and women, when they're not, as you say, like pushing for themselves, their rights, their individualism, but they're really, you know, trying to see how they can better the world. I mean, one of the things Wilson Craft does is she talks about how real maturity when you see real maturity, it's not only in a self mastery, an, uh, but it's self mastery for the for the end of benevolence. So it's always like going outward. So we master ourselves, we master our appetites, you know, what I want, what I desire, we master all those things in order to be free to love others. And it's loving others first and foremost, in our own families, you know, she talked a lot about kind of the duties of care within the family to in spouses, children, elderly parents, but then also, as you say, to go out to the rest of the world. And we can only be free to do those things when we're not beholden to the kind of slaves of the app. We're not slaves to our appetites. Um, and that's what I think is so that people don't really understand, you know, not only are they slaves to kind of like the capitalist man or their boss, basically, but they're slaves to really all of these kind of desires to be you know, for fame, for honor, for pleasure, for power, for money. It's all just a slavery. And it's not the freedom that Christ gives us, which is this freedom to be for another, to be for our children, to be for our spouses, but to be for the rest of the world. And yes, sometimes to work too, to do intellectual work, to do work out there in the world, but always in order to serve. And that kind of freedom and the joy and peace that comes with that kind of freedom is something having been on both sides of this, <laughs> I can tell you is so real. I mean, I, you could never have told me when I was back there as a women's studies student that I would have seven children and be far more happy and free and peaceful and joyful and gratified in life than I was back then when I was really a miserable and depressed and anxious person. You have seven children? I do. Wow. <laughs> I'm so glad that came out. <laughs> That's beautiful. I do. Thank you. Yeah. And only, you know, why is that? How is that possible? Because I have this incredible husband with an enormous amount of virtue. And because of our partnership, as you say, our friendship, I mean, and it has become more and more fun as we go. Our oldest is now 20. And the things she brings to the world and all the laughter among the siblings. I mean, yeah, it was, of course, very hard when they were all little, little. But um, yeah, it's just such an enormous blessing to us to have this this life together. Okay, so you have a 20-year-old, and so that leads perfectly, Erica, to our next question. And actually, just as you keep reflecting back to before you came to Christ and, and after, because those were your younger years. But we have a lot of young listeners, young women who listen to this podcast. So we always like to ask our guests for advice for these young women. Now, it can be whatever you want. It could be on these topics. Um, but but what advice do you have for the young women who are growing up in this culture today? Yeah, I mean, I always, I hate to like just push someone to go watch a video of mine, but I did do um, a probably 45 minute talk on work-life balance for the Given Institute, which I would recommend because I think it, um, I just talk about kind of the structure that um, the church gives in terms of um, of thinking about that our relationship with God is always first, then our spouse, then our children, and then our work. And obviously, for young children, for for young women, um, 
the spouse probably isn't in the picture, neither are the children, but they do have God and they have their work. And so what should they do about that? And how can they think about their vocation in general? And I always say, you know, the most important thing, obviously, and this should go without saying, but it has to be said, (laughs) is that you have to make time every day for daily prayer. And so I, you know, just said I have a lot of kids. I obviously do work and I try to make time in the morning for a half an hour of prayer. Um, And if I can, I try to be as far away from other people. So where I work, there's a small chapel where I can sit and pray. And so I try to take the scriptures or rather some other type of kind of inspiring spiritual reading and just allow God to really, uh, you know, to allow my life to basically be given over to him every morning so that I can um, just remind him that I am entirely his. I mean, one of the, I love um, Bishop Barron, who's this big force in the Catholic Church right now, but he talks a lot about how your life is not your own. And I think when we know that our life is not our own and that we are but like a kind of um, peace in God's plan, that our life takes, takes on this great horizon because it's like God's universe that he has in, in, in mind, so many greater things than our kind of little myopic way of thinking about our life. Um, again, I never would have imagined so many things that have happened. So I, I would just say that prayer, making prayer really the center of our, of our lives is, is really crucial. I mean, as a Catholic, I also go to daily mass um, and receive, um, you know, what we understand to be the body and blood of Jesus every day. And that is an incredibly transformative power in my life, um, do other very Catholic prayers, the rosary every day. But those kinds of things I think are really crucial um, to basically being able to discern where God wants us um, and to, to take seriously our studies when we're studying, to take seriously our work when we're working, to take seriously our friendships, to really be there for other people and to realize that all the virtues that you're building in your life, whether you're an athlete, a student, um, working out in there in the world, all the virtues you are building in your life, you're cementing the character that you will be when you are, when you do find that person, when you are married, when you do have children and all of those virtues will help you to balance whatever it is that God has in store for you. So take kind of, don't be just looking ahead. I mean, I know some Christian women kind of, they're looking ahead to when they're married, like that's when my life will start or when they have children. And don't be a person like that. Be a person who's taking seriously every day and the place God has for them every day. Um, But also don't be a person who thinks that they have to accomplish all sorts of things in their career before they have married, that they're married, because I think that that's also a stumbling block too. Um, There's so much we can do when we're married. I read loads of books, um, very highly intellectual books on like, you know, constitutional law, legal theory with children all around me. Um, and, uh, and so there is work that can be done, uh, depending on, you know, your marriage, the kinds of circumstances that you have, um, when you're married too. So those are kind of the, I guess the advice I would give. Mm-hmm. Well, and your children are probably picking up on, I, I'm curious to know if some of your children might enjoy talking about the stuff that you love, because I feel like our children, even if it's bizarre things, you know, like really in, um, detailed information about law, our children end up curious and loving the things that we love so often. Do you, do you have good conversations with your kids? Are they catching it? Yeah. 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 It's great. Actually, my 20 year old is a student at Notre Dame and she is an incredibly bright philosophy pre-med student. She's going to be far smarter (laughs) than I ever, ever will be. Um, But then I have two girls next to her. They just have their eyes set, I think, much more on domestic life. They love being with young children. Um, one is at Boston College. He's actually a Division One track athlete. Very, very dedicated to kind of just really hard work and living a life of virtue kind of on the track and in her friendships and um, really beautiful. So it's it's been just wonderful to see them grow. I actually have a three-year-old, which has been after a seven-year kind of seven-year gap in my, um, after the sixth child, we had a three-year-old seven years later. And she has been an enormous gift because all the other kids get to be see the responsibilities that come with um, caring for children. And I think that's been a, a real unexpected but beautiful gift in our family as well. Yeah, just quick side note. I have the same scenario. Not seven children. I have four children, but I have an eight-year gap. And then I have three girls and then eight-year gap and a little boy. So there's all kinds of new oh. things happening, but it's so fun. 
But we love to talk about books, and I know you're a reader. Um, what have been some books, and I'm kind of nervous to ask this because I probably won't even understand the title, but um, <laughs> what have been some books that have influenced you? Yeah, so let me um, let me tell you. First, uh, Wright's Talk was the most influential book um, that Marianne Glendon, who's a now-retired Harvard Law professor, she wrote in the 1990s, and that was the book that kind of changed my life. Um, she is an internationally acclaimed um, scholar of rights, of law, um, and she actually is one of the heroines of my current book, The Rights of Women. Um, so she was, that book was really, really um, influential in my life. Rights Talk, still really important today, still has tons of insight to give today. So if anyone wants to buy it now, they'd learn just as much, I think. Um, and then I would just definitely say Aristotle's Ethics really important to really ground a life um, in kind of virtue and ethics, understanding kind of virtue as the mean between two extremes um, and the life of kind of friendship. I mean, he talks a lot about kind of the different kinds of friendship, I think really important. Um, the Bible, of course, um, you know, back when I first read the Bible um, back in college, I just, I'd been, you know, in 12 steps, 12 step meetings and I, decided after I met all these Christians, I was going to take a class on the Bible. And it was really funny because it was taught by this kind of historical critic, right, who didn't kind of believe any of it. But here I am, this uh, this kind of crazy feminist who's now taking this book, you know, start thing on the Bible. And every time we get to Jesus' words, I was just like, they're true. I just know them to be true. <laughs> so the Bible, of course, is just um, just, you know, the power of of Christ and his message um, is just, you can't, I mean, you got to go to it every day. Um, and then I also, you know, as a Catholic, the catechism of the Catholic church and other kind of saints of the church have been St. Thomas Aquinas, Augustine have been really important um, teachers for me as well. On the topic of books, we just, to our listeners want to recommend, if you are listening to this conversation and you want to hear more from Erica, first of all, we will link to that talk of Erica's and also get Erica's book, Rights of Women Reclaiming a Lost Vision. Um, okay, Erica, last question that I'm excited to hear your answer. But as you think about all the women in history and maybe even living currently today, if there is one woman you would choose that you would want to emulate and imitate with your life, who would that be? Well, I'm going to have to go to the top because <laughs> there's so many great women out there, but I just have to kind of go to the top. And as a Catholic, this will maybe seem obvious, but I'm going to go to um, Mary's, you know, Jesus' mother, Mary. And that is because of that moment at the Annunciation um, where she shows this enormous docility to God's will. And I just think it's got, it's the model, you know, in the Catholic church, we take that as the model for both women and men. It's not only women who are docile, <laughs> men have to be docile to women, uh, to, to God's will too. And I think because that docility, I mean, think of what it opened up in her life. And we sometimes think like, oh, that couldn't be true of me. I mean, obviously we're not going to be bearers of the actual God, <laughs> but we can be God bearers of God's word in so many different ways. And I think she, just that moment of docility, just always remembering her docility to the Holy Spirit um, just has to be the model, I think, for all of us. <laughs> but I take it as my model, my premier model as well. That's a great answer. And a good challenge, for sure. Well, Erica, we have enjoyed this conversation so much, and um, I can't wait to go read more of your work and watch that work-life balance. I'm excited about that. And uh, we appreciate you spending this time with us. Thank you. It's been really wonderful to be with you. 